Yeah, I'm basically recording. Can you hear me right? Yes, all right, good. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk about juggling in Haskell. Um, it's going to be, um, sorry, it's too late. Um, it's going to be like very introductory Haskell. It's just a topic uh, that I think is kind of fun. Because um, I like juggling and I like Haskell. So, I think this is kind of neat, it's like, uh, it's um, not sort of immediately obvious that there's this nice sort of underlying mathematical basis of, uh, of juggling, and we can sort of codify it nicely in Haskell, and it, it sort of, it's a really cool way to, uh, to learn new tricks by like, using sort of various structures, like you, you can just look at the data structures and, and figure out uh, a few things that you didn't know uh, were possible, uh, possible to juggle. Um, so actually a lot of the ones that when I was learning to juggle, this was like proved to be a really useful tool. Um, okay, so sorry, I'm going to have to keep reminding myself what I'm talking about. Um, so just a little bit, I need to sort of do a little bit of juggling, so it's like a very visual thing. So um, to sort of illustrate the basic ideas, we we'll look at some code and then we we'll do some uh, uh, just sort of look at the code and all the sort of one bit of comments and things. Um, please stop me like not all that much content, so hopefully it runs a bit short and just questions. Um, Okay, so um, the first juggling pattern that I'll show is uh, three ball cascade. Um, I'm probably going to make a lot of mistakes because I'm really not a very good juggler. It's like professional Haskell, obvious juggler, not like the other way around. So um, this is a three ball cascade, and I'm going to use this to illustrate a bunch of different ideas. Okay, okay. so that's probably like one of the, um, like that's the thing that everybody learns first, right? It's the, like the simplest trick. If you're going to learn it, you first learn to do this. And then where I click my fingers, you throw the extra ball, and then, you know, that's a three ball um, flash, I guess. Um, and then the cascade is where you just keep doing it indefinitely. Right? So every ball is doing the same thing. Um, if you, let's say, watch one of the balls, you'll notice that um, every ball sort of takes the same pattern, sort of identical in the pattern, right? And I think it's, none of the balls are special. Um, and you'll notice if you watch one of them that if you think about the beats, like if you listen to like the, like, you know, the sound as I juggle, um, there's three beats between every throw of a given ball, right? So, throw, throw, sorry, let's try again. Throw, throw, two, three, throw, two, three, throw. Okay, so um, it's called the three ball cascade. The pattern numerically is written as just the number three, okay? And what that means is, um, Every ball, so the, I'm going to go over this notation a little bit, but you'll see a lot of numbers, and I'll just quickly explain what this means. Um, the three refers to the number of beats that the ball is in the air, so two, three, catch, right? Um, and every ball is always doing three throws, right? So the pattern is called three, meaning three, 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 three. You know, I throw a three throw, I throw another three throw, and so on in there. Okay? Um, so there's a lot of variants that people can learn of the uh, three ball cascade. So I'll probably mess these up. But there's a reverse cascade, which you can either think of as instead of throwing the balls under, I'm going to throw the balls over. Okay. Or you can think about it as the time reversal of a regular three ball cascade. Right? So if you videotaped me doing a three ball cascade and then reversed it in time, you would get a reverse cascade. Um, there's also something called tennis. Um, so basically, uh, the short version is you can do all sorts of things that are like uh, embellishments of the idea, but in terms of like which balls get thrown when and how often they, how long they stay in the air, all of these patterns are the same, right? Um, if you look at this, every ball gets thrown on the third beat, every ball is in the air at any given time for three beats. The same facts are true of the reverse cascade. Similarly, if I do like underhanded throws, right? Nothing is changing by the pattern, it's sort of like. Um, they're kind of like um, topologically equivalent or something, right? Um, I can do uh, this like tennis, for example, like if I throw up at the top and the same ball always goes up at the top. It's called tennis. Um, yeah, so I won't show any more of those. But um, the point is, there's a lot of variants of the three ball cascade where every ball is always on, you know, we're always doing three throws. I'm not particularly interested in this talk and like 
where the balls are particularly going. I'm interested in how long they spend in the air relative to the, the other balls and the order of the throws. And that's what will make the, uh, the things non equivalent, the different patterns non equivalent. Right? So, for example, I'll do two things that are now non equivalent and hopefully you see what I mean. So, three ball cascade and then correct the throw. That took longer than I thought it would. Okay. Um, so, this, I'll, I'll throw something in and you'll hopefully see that it's not what I'm doing right now. Okay, so that was numerically that's a forward two, and I'm going to try and explain why that's called a forward two. Okay, um, and I said four ball fountain, sorry, I said four ball fountain on here, which I'm not going to try and juggle because I will definitely mess it up. But these are all like standard names, and you can Google them. Much better jugglers than me will demonstrate. Okay, so here's some of the patterns. I will probably do some of these. Um, so five one, again, I'll, I'll go over all these numbers only. <coughs> 5-1 is what people normally think of when they think of, uh, like, you think of, like, you think of juggling three balls, you sort of imagine all the balls going around in a circle, right, so. So that's 5-1. Um, it's a 5, so you'll see two types of throws happening. There's this one, it's a very low energy throw, very low, and there's this one, which is the 5, right, so 5 indicates higher energy, more high frequency. Right. So, um, just with two balls, it's like high energy, low energy, in quick succession. Okay. Uh, five, two, two, <coughs> how does that one work? So, three ball cascade, high energy, and then nothing, I guess. So, I guess that's a five, two, two. It doesn't look very interesting. Four, four, one um, is going to be two um, relatively high energy throws followed by a very low energy throw across. Divided by two is three. Uh, five, two, two, four, four, one. They all average to three, right? So there's a theorem that says if you have 
the valid throw, uh, sorry, valid pattern, the average is the number of balls. So the converse isn't true. So I can't just like, make up some numbers that average to three and like hope to juggle it. Like, um, like one five probably wouldn't work. Right? Oh, but it would be, be able to start it if you want to have like three hands. But like in general, um, yeah, you can't just like average, find something that averages and hope that it's juggled. That's not true. Um, but it's always true that the number of balls is the average if you have a juggle, if you have a valid pattern. Um, there is always, uh, just like there was a notation, but the, just like there's a notation, like notation three means the three ball cascade, there's always a pattern that's like the ground state pattern for um, any given number of balls, right? So uh, this is the one ball cascade. This is the two ball cascade, right? Um, I'm only doing that because it's like really sort of very interesting to do this, but that's the two ball cascade, right? Um, three ball cascade here. And you can do more and more, and like as uh, so four ball cascade, I, I'm sort of missing the ball, but you know, it kind of looks like that. Uh, with the extra ball, both hands doing the same thing, basically doing sort of that with, with both hands. Uh, five ball cascade is, I can't do it because I'm not that good, but uh, it's like a three ball cascade with ball sort of passing from hand to hand. Um, there's always one of those, it's always the one that like uh, minimizes the total energy, or you can sort of think of it that way. There's no sort of like flourishes, or like it's the most basic. Uh, the most basic pattern that uh, has that number of balls. Uh, does that answer your question? Um, oh, that's, oh, oh, yeah, I, I, yeah. We definitely have time if you want to. Yeah, what's that? We have, there's not a lot of content, so if you want to like, ask it over, <laughs> <laughs> if I don't answer it. Okay, I mean, okay, so, um, this is the, the time that each ball, when you're doing the five one, the time that each ball spent in the air, mm -hmm. is that equal to also two beats? Yeah, um, basically with the way you can think about that is that um, I'm going to try, this is some of the stuff I'm going to try and go over, but um, the idealized version of this is that the one ball going across the bottom here, and then you've got the five ball here, yeah. so the one ball spent one beat in the air, okay. right, so nothing happens between the time it takes for you to throw this and catch it in the other hand. Yeah. But four things happen on five throw. Oh. Five like events will happen, five beats happen between um, me, like you know, throwing the five and catching it and throwing it. What, so what it's kind of hard to see because it's like there's yeah. a lot going on. But after a high, you might some can't be able to see it. Like if you watch my hands while one ball goes over, well you can so hear it. What was it? Your when they land in your hand, it yeah. generates a rhythm. Yeah, you can kind of hear the beats a little bit, but with the five one, it's so with the three ball cascade, you can kind of do it there here, right? It's like very rhythmical, but like try. I tend to sort of throw it high, so the beats tend to be like a little off. But yeah, you can. It's very like musical, right? It's like a definite beat, so hopefully that helps a little bit. I have a question. Yeah. Does anyone juggle with collar balls? Yeah. So if you're smart and like do the top better than I would, <laughs> if you would have like one red ball or something, but like follow the red ball. Uh, I didn't mean to be <laughs> one I meant you're identifying you, the reason these uh, you were talking about topology and trajectories, the reason they're equivalent is because they're the same. Yeah. But if you were to introduce like different or color balls, mm -hmm. they might you might have fewer equivalences. So do people think about it that way? Um, almost certainly. Like I, I don't know the answer to, like I'll just say like the subject is like very well studied and like I had a book that I meant to bring called like the mathematics of juggling and it's like it, all sorts of topics right like if you juggle and sort of walk through the air you can trace the braid and like when the braids homeomorphic and all these things it's like it's a very like well studied subject. Um, I'm sure like some people just like got better, got better. Um, any other questions? Okay. Um, so Alright I'll try and explain a little bit about it in a little bit more detail about that stuff. So throws. Um, so you saw all the numbers, right? Uh, I'll try and explain what they mean. So odd throws are throws that change hands. So one thing you might have noticed was that the three goes from one hand to the other hand. Okay? But the two, uh, or the four, let's say, when I was doing the four pattern, I was doing this, right? The fours and the twos always go to the same hand. In fact, the two I just hold in one hand because it's like such a low energy throw that it's kind of like unimpressive to, to really throw it. And I don't have time to do anything while it's in the air anyway. Um, so odd throws go between hands, even throws stay in the same hand. Okay. Um, hands take turn 
doing things, right? So left, right, left, right. Um, and a hand does at most one thing at a time, right? So we're not interested in like, you know, whatever, like this kind of stuff. Like, I can catch one ball and I can throw one ball and I'll allow it to be on any given time, not on any given beat. Okay. Um, and I already kind of said this, but like num uh, the numbers that we're going to talk about measure the amount of time that the ball spent in the air. So a three throw, um, I'll throw the ball, two other things will happen, and then on the third beat, uh, it should get thrown again. Right, so three, three, three. Um, so one obvious question is, um, if I'm in a given state, if I find myself in the middle of juggling, I might want to think about the patterns I'm able to throw next. And if we're going to study this like um, in a structured way, we're going to definitely want to answer this question. Um, and another way of thinking about that is, what, if a hand can only do at most one thing, then what, what future hand positions currently have nothing to do? Right? So in the three ball cascade, it's the low energy um, pattern, right? And it, there's no sort of, um, there's nowhere to put anything, right? All I can, uh, in order to sort of make a gap for a hand to do something, I have to throw a high energy throw. You, you know, like I have to have a higher number than three. I certainly can't have anything like lower because like if I try and throw a one, for example, that hand's going to be busy doing something else. Okay, um, so I need to have a hand that's free and currently scheduled to do nothing um, in order to be able to throw a ball to that hand. And in order to do that, I previously have to throw a higher energy throw. So this is sort of an interesting question. We can try and figure out which ones. Uh, try and find a structured way of thinking about which hands are going to become free. Okay, so that's throws. Uh, patterns. Patterns are just valid sequences of. Right, so 33333 is a valid pattern. 33342 is always valid. 333, what did I say, 441, that's valid. 51. Um, I already mentioned this theorem. Okay, so that uh, if, if you have a valid pattern, then it has to average out uh, to the number of balls you currently have um, throwing. Right? Um, which, if you take a contrapositive, um, gives you a nice uh, corollary, which is that if the average of a pattern you wish to throw is not a natural number, then you're never going to be able to throw it. Right? Um, that can't possibly be any valid. That can't possibly be a valid pattern. Um, so the proof of this is like uh, not particularly hard, I think. Like um, the notation name side swaps, I believe, come, comes from this idea that like, given a valid pattern, you can swap two of the positions. Right? I can like take a throw that was scheduled later on and bring it earlier. But in order to do that, I have to like so sort of, there has to be sort of conservation of energy type of thing, right? Like one. If I was going to throw a ball, let's say two threes, I could swap them and they one one goes earlier in time, one goes later in time, so one has to sort of like decrease its amount of time in the air, one has to increase its amount of time in the air, so I get four and two. But this operation of like adding some amount to one of the two numbers and subtracting it from the other doesn't change the average. So if you start from the ground state and you can show that you get all patterns this way, then um, you know the average has to be the same average as the average of the ground state and the average of the ground state is the number of Okay, uh, the last idea of state diagrams. So um, there's two types of diagrams people usually use when they're juggling. One which I don't have here, but which I definitely should have included. Um, and I think about it is you have sort of time on one axis, and you have it's actually you have two lines indicating the two hands, and the beat sort of like chop up on the other, the axis along you know time intervals. And then you sort of just draw straight lines on the balls. And that's like a really useful uh, like graphical notation. Um, but the one that is easier to codify that I'll show is. Uh, uh, you can sort of think of those, I call them state diagrams. I'm not sure if there's a proper name. Um, we basically need to track all future landing first. So think about the three ball cascade. Um, think about the three ball cascade. At any given point, there's three balls that are scheduled. I need to think of like sort of three balls ahead, right? Um, it's sort of not obvious why that's true, so I won't go into that too much. But if you at least think about the three balls that are about to land. You can sort of denote it like this, right? Um, time, the, the next row is going to be the one on the right. So imagine that ball's coming in uh, from the future and traveling left to right. Okay, so I have the three, three balls that I need to throw uh, that will arrive on the next three leads. Okay. Um, if we do a four throw, for example, not so, so what? Um, so you can think about what happens with the, the three ball cascade. Right? At any given time, I take the one that's about to land. Time advances by one step. So everything shunts over to the left by one time step. So we have, you know, going from right to left, we're like ball, ball, gap, gap. Right? And as I throw a three throw, that ball is going to be in the air three beats. And it's going to land in the three slot, right? So we're going to go from this state back to itself. It's just a little loop in the state path. Okay? So we, 
you think about this like Haskell, it's like drop one and then I insert one in position three. Right? And we go back to the, it's just rotating that right most ball onto the left end of the like, cube. Right? Um, so that's three, three, three. Like, so we can look at some other ones. If we throw a four throw, we get this, right? So we have two balls that are about to be drawn on the next two beats, then a gap when nothing currently is scheduled to happen, and then a ball coming in four beats into the future um, that I just threw, right? And then we can fill that gap with a two throw and get back into the ground state. Again. Okay, so I took my right most ball, picked it out, shunted everything over to the left, and inserted it at position two. Right? So that was throw out a three ball cascade, and then a four throw, and back to three. And the two is like this. Doing this okay, so that tells us like graphically we can like reason that like the 4 2 pattern what I was just doing can be inserted into a three-ball cascade. So we can go through the other ones and the state diagrams work like this. So we start in the grain state, we throw a fourth row, that's this ball, okay. Um, then imagine shunting that all over to the left, inserting another four. So that's the two fours we just threw, and then this one. The only thing I can reasonably do without throwing higher than, let's say, five at this point is then to take that most recent ball and insert it into the gap, right, which is a one throw. So that tells us that, so this, this one moves into this gap and becomes this ball, okay? Um, so that's why 441 is valid, uh, valid throw. So that was the two high energy ones in the shuttle across. So, so that's why that one got to. Um, 522, that was the one where the ball goes over the top and two hands do nothing, so it looks really boring, but um, you can sort of see by making the graphs a little bit wider so I can fit the five throws in. This one, you know, five, and then we fill in the two gaps with two two throws, and we get back to the ground state. But something goes wrong if we try and insert five one. So if I remember five one was this sort of big circle uh, throw, kind of, um, you know, when you think about the, the circular throwing. Um, if you try and throw this, it kind of goes a bit wrong, right? So, we throw a five, it goes here, the five ends up here, we have two more balls here. I can't throw a one right now because this one is scheduled, but I already have something landing in one time step. So you actually, you can insert a five one into three, 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 but you don't do it this way. Uh, you have to sort of keep one hand uh, occupied for a couple of beats, and then you can sort of, uh, it sort of works out too. It is possible, but it kind of looks awkward, and you have this hands up doing nothing for a second while like this one catches up and like quickly like uh, throws all the fives in. Okay, so this tells us that like naively you can't throw a five on immediately after you walk. Okay, but these um, this graphical notation is enough to like build up a graph of like states and transitions, right? So if we do that, then we can study. Uh, um, that, that's enough information to figure out which patterns are valid. Um, and we'll find some new interesting words. Ask the questions there. Um, any questions? No? Um, okay, so we can construct this graph of states. The vertices are going to be these states. Basically, I'm going to label the vertices uh, with this kind of data. Right? I'm going to track some amount of uh, future activity in the vertices. And to move between um, states, I'm going to do throws. Right? So throws are very energy will take me between the valid states. And of course I can throw, given enough strength, I can throw like infinitely hard, like arbitrarily high, right? So the, the graph is um, sort of uh, has like an infinite finite potentially, but typically the way we do this is we think of, we say, okay, I'm gonna throw to high seven. Uh, like that's the, the highest energy throw I care about. Let's look at the graph of all states and transitions, states and throws of three balls up to high seven. Okay. Um, and then that's a graph that you can study. Um, so the edges of the throws and the cycles in that graph, if you start at, let's say, the ground state vertex um, and look for sort of patterns around the graph that get you back to the ground state, those will be the patterns that you can insert into a three ball cascade. So the balls will be lined up in such a way that you're throwing the ground state pattern, do some stuff, and then as long as like the future balls will line up in such a way that you will have three balls immediately ready to throw, i.e. you're back in the ground state pattern, you can carry on with the three ball cascade. Um, and it get, get something that looks a little bit like this, right? So this is all, so I kind of get a bad example because this is like height five, which is, if you do like height four, it's like, if you do if you do height three, you end up with like, see that cycle at the top, that's like the three ball cascade, going round, 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 so that's the, the, there's only one pattern you can throw that stays in the three state, sorry, in the height three state, 
um, because you don't start having any room to like, if you can't throw anything higher than a three, you have to throw something at least as high as a three, right? So it's really uninteresting. Maximum height four is slightly more interesting, but why is the complexity between these two? Um, between like a vertex of one loop and this. Um, but you can look at this, right? So at the very top, the vertex at the top there is, um, sorry, uh, is the ground state. Um, and you can sort of trace around this directed graph and try and find paths. And like, this is how I learned to, uh, like I knew how to do a three ball cascade and I sort of knew how to do this like four two and stuff. And then I, I sort of looked at this and like, oh, maybe I can do that, you know, set myself a challenge, like maybe I can do like this particular cycle and like see which one I can figure out. Um, it's kind of fun to try and find a path in this one. So I want to show how we can code this up in Haskell quickly. Um, go through the code and like, uh, we'll have like a lazy data structure that basically captures uh, the unconstrained graph, like no, no maximum height, and then we'll do a traverse log that shows uh, findings of blue So, uh, yeah, ask for time. Anyone have questions before I do that? Yep. Yeah. Could I ask a question about, um, can you describe more what it means to take a force transition from the top say, down oh, yeah. to the bottom, the one that the four goes to? Let's do, so four two is the, the simplest one, right? Um, um, do you want me to do four two? Is that, I think that one's probably the... I think so, yeah. It was a little more transition out of the ground state. Yeah, so, so this is the ground state. Does it sort of make sense why this is the ground state, first of all? Um, the, is, is, is the ground state that it is... The ground state is a path, right? Sorry, I, I use that as like a shot and it's sort of like what people. Um, sorry, good. Um,
cool if I could sit there and actually do it by
So this function needs to tell me whether it's possible to draw this thing and then give me the new state back if it was possible. Okay. Um, so there's a little special case here, which is um, I should explain this backwards, right? If I if I currently have something scheduled and available to throw on the next given time, right? So that, that's this true in the pattern match here, right? If the state says the next beat is uh, I have a ball available, then I can throw that ball, right? Otherwise, if I don't have something available in that time slot, then all I can do is nothing, right? Which is wait a, wait a beat, um, which means that all I can do is just drop that false state off of the state and just let time, like basically I do nothing with my hands and I let time uh, step along by one time step, okay? So I just move the state, the, ne the next time step will be the remainder of the state. Um, if I do have a ball that's available to be thrown, and I want to throw to a height greater than zero, so remember, zero was doing nothing, right? So every, like, everything else greater than zero is all the things I can do with actually doing something. Right? So if I want to throw to a height greater than zero, and I have a ball to throw, and there is not currently something scheduled at position H minus one um, in my state, right? So there's not currently a ball like in the middle of the state there. Um, so it's h minus one because remember this x is I took the true off the front, right? So um, so I look at position h minus one in the tail, uh, make sure it's, it's currently unscheduled. If that is true, then I can update the position h minus one in x uh, to true, right? Saying it's scheduled. Um, so the true will get dropped off the front, meaning time will like, proceed by one time step, um, and I can stick a true where that ball is scheduled to land in the future, and everything else is invalid. No other throws at all. Any questions on that? No. Okay, so there's this function you could write called throw pattern, right? Which I think this is like kind of nice. It just illustrates some like basic um, capabilities and like, uh, like the expressivity of a language like Haskell, I guess. Right, so if I, um, this is how to throw a single ball. If I want to throw a whole pattern of balls, then I have a pattern P and a state, and I can ask the compiler for a bit of help, and it said, find a ball made a state. Um, well, to, um, to throw a bunch of patterns, to, to throw a bunch of uh, balls of given height, I can just throw them in succession, right? And I need to sort of um, <clears throat> move the state along from time step to time step as I do so. Um, so there's a nice function in the standard library for this called 4 m and I can never remember the order of the arguments, but I'm pretty sure there's three of them. So I've got three types of balls. Um, no, it doesn't, no, I've got that, okay. Yeah, I've got to import that from data dot rest. Hold that. Uh, oh, thank you. I know it's a Haskell honest. No. It's where that existed. Just changed. 
step four, five to add number. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, so that is the ground state, right? Um, but if I try and throw, let's say, four, one, oh, the one we, we said we couldn't do was five, one, right? So that returns nothing. So um, thankfully, that um, tells me that that is a bad idea. So if I do, I think if I do five and then two, and then one? No, I don't know, there's some way to do this, I can't remember. Um, to get into the five, one state. Okay, uh, any questions on four, then? Or Press on. Like I said, this is not like particularly like uh, advanced stuff. I just like to kind of go through some of these basic things. Um, so another function that could probably benefit from a much better designed uh, data structure but, uh, is possibilities. So given a state, tell me the possible uh, high time throw to and the states they will take me to. Okay. So if this, if so, zero is kind of a weird uh, common case that I always have to deal with, right? But if I have a false at the front, the only thing I can throw is high zero. I can't do anything else. So I have this as a little special case. Really, I think you can probably think of zero as like nothing rather than zero. It's not like the other numbers in a certain way. It just so happens like the theorem of the averages like works out nicely. So it sort of behaves the same for all intents and purposes. But like it sort of is a special case. Um, if we do have a false throw. Uh, then I can just try each height and turn from height zero up to infinity, right? Um, and see if, uh, so try and throw the thing for each height. I'll get a maybe, turn that into a list, and use a list comprehension to get more possibilities. Okay, um, okay. so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to try and, um, I'm going to build like a, uh, oh, I changed this actually, uh, sorry. Eventually, the, the, the first version I had of this, I had like a rose tree, where like I was like unfolding a rose tree of all the possible states. Um, and then I had a, a traversal algorithm, but then, you know, when you traverse it, you only get the states because it's a rose tree. Um, what you really want is the heights, right? So you want to say, like, give me this traversal and some of the heights that I have to throw to get to the interesting states. Um, so the data structure I ended up uh, changing it into is, is this sort of labeled, uh, labeled rose tree, where it's a, it's a recursive tree, right? So a tree has two, two, sort of, two bits of data. It has um, the value of the, of the branch, and it has a bunch of children. Right. Each child is labeled with the edge label that takes you to the next node, um, and the tree underneath um, that that edge takes you. Um, so you can sort of think of this as all the possible throws are going to fall into this tree, um, and every edge along that tree is going to be labeled. It's, it's the graph we were talking about before, but I'm representing it sort of uh, asymmetrically as a, as a tree instead of as a graph. Um, Every edge is going to be labeled by the height that I uh, that I'm throwing to. So you see, the thing I'm actually interested in is tree height state. Um, edges have heights. Um, vertices have state labels. So I have a little, um, I've got a little help function here called the unfold tree. Um, it takes a, it's going to, it's going to uh, co-recursively build up the tree from um, an initial state. Um, and for any given state, I have to tell you the two functions, the label that will go on the branch for that state, and the set of all labeled children, sorry, edge and children uh, pairs, child tree pairs that uh, can originate from the state. Okay, so given these two functions, I can unfold the tree, and I'm going to you know, obviously consume this thing um, finally. Uh, so the infinite, you know, I'm never sort of materializing this infinite tree um, using lazy evaluation to make sure I only sort of um, uh, pluck off the bits of the tree that, I, that I'm actually interested in evaluating. Okay, so given this function, um, I can build up this value here, this tree height state. This is this, this infinite graph that has, um, it was the infinite version of the graph that I had on the slide, right? Um, where there's no sort of restriction on the heights that I can throw. Um, by using unfold tree, and uh, at any given um, <coughs> I'm going to use the identity function to pull out the state, whereas so this S to A is going to be identity, so A actually is going to be S, which is why you know, I, my values in the, I'm actually just like exposing the whole state here. Um, at any given state, the, the state itself will be the branch label. And uh, that, that I need, you know, if I put the type ball here, it will say I need a function state to list of higher state, while possibilities fills that type ball. So we'll put that in, and that allows us to build this infinite tree. Um, that sort of represents this graph, this unfolding of this graph. Uh, it's like a, what do you call it, like a, 
sorry, spanning tree, but it's it's not. Uh, it's it's more than a spanning. It's sort of, it's like the spanning tree, but we sort of keep going. At any uh, we keep sort of grafting on spanning trees as we go deeper and deeper into the graph. Um, okay, and then we have this function called search tree, right? So this tell this gives you a stop, given a stopping condition and a state to begin at. Give me all of the patterns that take me to the states I'm interested in. Right? So if I say, for example, search tree, if search for the states that uh, where I get back to the ground state, and I start in the ground state, okay, well, if I do that, uh, let's see, not in scope, search tree, not in scope, it's ground. Oh, did I not reload? There we go. All right, so it'll happily sort of sit there and like enumerate all the patterns from the you know, this is every pattern, right? Um, but I, I don't want to do that. I want to like start. Uh, so, so we have this. It's so interesting already, right? Because I have this value here that's like infinite and representing like all the juggling knowledge about the like three all the three ball patterns ever, like where we don't do like multiplex juggling or anything like particularly fancy, is encoded into this one infinitely like complex, lazily evaluated Haskell value, which I think is kind of cool. Question? Uh, I did like a Um, so 
bunch of patterns. Uh, then I can do uh, traverse patterns. interested like uh, you were mentioning you could do this more efficiently but uh, if you were to write this in pure script could you just speak to like maybe some decisions you've made differently um, yeah so I, uh, I I didn't write this in pure script because I think like the so you can do laziness in pure script but you have to have like lazy constructors like the lazy data type and then you have like force and defer and like it just kind of gets in the way of things I think like you can totally do it if you wanted to like make like a web demo or something Totally could do it. In fact, like I have, um, I have a little pure script app. I wrote it originally in Elm. It's on my blog. Um, that you like put the pattern in, so you put like four four one. It has like two hands, and it like shows the. You know, um, and you can totally do it. Like the laziness is is by no means essential. You can totally do this without laziness. In fact, like there's some places where this is not lazy, right? Like I had this like repeat false thing. It'd be kind of cool if like the data structure had like all future times or something. I was like sort of taking off lazily the amount. Um, I rewrote it in Haskell because I thought uh, it'd be kind of cool to show that the graph, uh, like it was unfolded like this. Uh, I thought it was like kind of a nice presentation of it. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, you can you can totally uh, you can totally do it where um, you just sort of like the, the, the typical way people do this is they fix the height up front, right? They just say generate the height up to like the graph I showed, uh, and then they just do regular graph traverse along the top. But you have to regenerate the graph then if you want to you change your mind about like the height or whatever. Yeah, there's, there's nothing to stop you doing that. You can like go script or whatever. Yeah. Is there a point uh, in which the height should just become like not feasible? Is uh, yeah, I mean well for me, like I can't I, I can like I can throw like a five throw in the context of, like I could maybe like um, Throw like a five throw like somewhere in the middle of like a three ball cascade, but I'm not like a very good juggler, so I can't juggle like five balls, like a five ball cascade, for example. Right, so that's kind of my upper limit. But um, the, the, we were talking about this earlier. I think like the limit, like the human limit, currently is like 13 or 15 or something. Like, and you can see, you go on YouTube, you can see people do like, yeah, I think you've got like a 13 ball flash, meaning you literally like throw 13 balls in the air and catch 13 balls, and like that's the trick. Right, that's like. You submit that to the Guinness Book of Records or something. Um, like that's the like the, the limit that people can throw. But like it it gets like I can't throw five, right? Like they get harder and harder as you go. Like you need to like use more strength and stuff. So it's, it's yeah, it's a challenge. Um, 
But I find, but I find it more interesting to look at the low energy drugs, not just because I'm like too bad to talk the high ones, but because like there's, there's a lot you can do with three balls, right? Like that's the fun of it. It's like there's an infinite like data structure there waiting to tell you cool stuff you can do with just three balls. Any other questions? I'm going to start late on the other talk, so. All right. Cool. Thank you.